Hello AP Physics students, this is Mr. Eveley coming to you via video. I'd like to give you a short introduction to something I normally have students just read about in the textbook. The topic is called crossed fields. You're going to read about it on pages 740 to 743 in the text. So a whopping four pages. But there's a lot on those pages and some of it can get a little confusing. So since I'm not around, I'd like to give a brief introduction, a short video, just to get some of the mysteries out of the way. Now, can an electric field and in a magnetic field uh, exist in the same space? And obviously they can. So a particle traveling through that space where there's both kinds of fields will experience two different forces, one from the electric field and one from the magnetic field. So if both fields are present, it feels or experiences both forces. So you're going to read about this in the textbook. So let me give you a scenario here that's not in, quite in the textbook. Uh, the textbook deals with electrons moving through both types of fields. I'm going to take a positive charge because with positive charges, the directions are a little bit easier. The right hand rule is a little easier. Let's give it a shot here. Now, as I draw this, I'm going to draw several arrows, and you have to be very conscious about what kinds of arrows I'm drawing. So this first arrow represents the velocity of the particle from left to right. So I'll put a little V here. And so as he goes from left to right, he's uh, experiencing the effect of two different fields. Let's draw the electric field first. So imagine I've got a pair of parallel plates. We'll make the top plate positive and the bottom plate negative. And you know what this means. It means we have an electric field between the plates represented by my green arrows in this direction. Okay, so this is the E field. If there's an E field downward, and this is a positive charge, the direction of the force, the electric force, on that positive charge, whether it's moving or not, is downward. It's very simple. So we have a force in this direction. Remember, this arrow it represents velocity. That is not a force. And that's due to the E field. Now, it's possible to set up a magnetic field in the same space to counteract this force. So could we create a magnetic force on this guy since he's moving? If he's going through a magnetic field, we could set it up so that the the force due to the B field is upward. Now, what is the direction of the magnetic field in such a case? All right, again, this represents the velocity vector. I'll put my fingers in the direction of the velocity. The thumb, remember, represents the direction of the force. I curl my fingers in the direction of the B field. So in other words, if there's a velocity this way and a B field this way, the force will be up. So I'll use purple marker here. Still looks kind of black to me, but we'll use purple marker to represent a magnetic field we're going to set up between the plates. Okay, and remember the X's represent the ends of the arrows going into the page, so the X represents a magnetic field into the page. So magnetic field into the page, if the velocity is to the right, creates a force up. Now, if we fiddle with these fields until these two forces are equal, this charged particle is just going to fly through as if nothing's going on, as if there's no fields present, because the effects of the two fields cancel out. Notice that the two fields are perpendicular to each other. We've got an electric field this way, we have a magnetic field into the page. That's why this is called crossed fields. The fields are crossed, crossed fields, okay? Now, little physics gang sign action. Remember, this is a velocity vector. Ignore that for a second. There are two forces on this particle. If we balance them out, the force due to the B field and the force due to the E field are balanced. Now, you know 
that E fields are defined as the force on a charge divided by the charge on that charge. So that means the force due to an E field is E times Q. Magnetic fields create a force, which is QV cross B. Now, the cross product is QVB sine theta, but the direction of the particle's velocity, V, and the magnetic field, in this case, are perpendicular. So we can lose the sine of theta and say sine of 90 degrees is 1. So the force due to the B field is QVB. Now, check out this equation. Wow. We lose the charge, the size of the charge, and we have this little guy, which says that the velocity of this little guy, the velocity that will cause these forces to balance out, is really the ratio of the fields. So the magnitude of the E field divided by the magnitude of the B field tells us how fast this little guy is moving if he's not affected by the presence of those two fields, the presence of the crossed fields. Okay. Now, when you read the book, starting on page 740, there's a nice discussion of an application of this. That is, when the electron was discovered and its charge to mass ratio was discovered, how did that all work? And it was crossed fields that made it possible. As you continue reading, you're going to read about something called the Hall effect, which is a little strange. So again, let me give you a short introduction to the Hall effect. It also uses crossed fields. And we will actually use this effect in the lab indirectly because our probes, our magnetic probes, use this effect to measure the strength of magnetic fields. OK, so here's how it works. Suppose you have a long strip of metal. Say it's copper. And you send a current through it. So we put a battery on it or some kind of um, EMF source, and we start sending current through it. Now, the direction of conventional current, let's say, is this way which means in real life, the electrons are moving that way. Okay. Now, there's zillions of them. I've just drawn one electron. This is, represents its drift velocity heading north, or heading toward the top of the page. Now, let's say that we take this piece of copper as the current is flowing through it and stick it in a magnetic field. Now, the magnetic field is represented by these purple X's that are going into the page. Okay. So we've got this negatively charged object. Here's its velocity. Here's the direction of the magnetic field. So I curl my fingers so they now point in the direction of the magnetic field. My thumb points to the left. Now remember, the right-hand rule is for positive particles. So we've got an electron. It means the force on it is going to be that way. So I've got a force on him due to the magnetic field that way, F sub B. Now, again, remember, there's lots of electrons heading this way. Okay, This just represents a velocity vector. This is a force vector. So again, be very conscious of what arrows I'm drawing. The electrons, therefore, are going to experience a force toward the right-hand side of this strip. So eventually, the right-hand side has electrons. They're still traveling toward the top of the page, but they're doing so on the right-hand side of the strip. The left-hand side, therefore, becomes slightly positively charged. And you know what's going to happen now. There's a field set up in the copper. Okay? And that field points that way, which means a positive charge in the copper will feel a force that way. A negatively charged object is going to feel a force this way. So just like in the previous explanation, we've got the two 
forces, the one due to the B field and the one due to the E field canceling out. Okay, this is just a velocity vector, don't worry about him. Okay, so once again, we've got these guys canceling out and this situation set up pretty quick, sets up pretty quickly so that now electrons are just flowing down the middle of the metal without feeling any deflection at all. Okay. So once again, just like in the last page, we're going to say E times the charge equals QVB because again, the velocity and the B field are perpendicular. Now, this is kind of like a pair of parallel plates. If we know the, the width of our copper strip and we take a voltmeter and run it between the two sides, okay, we can find the delta V. We know that delta V is equal to E times D or that the E is equal to delta V over D. So I can say delta V over D, that's the width of my copper strip. The charges cancel out, yes. This is the velocity of the electrons, sometimes called the drift velocity. And this is the B field. Now again, remember the drift velocity from last chapter depends upon the current, the cross-sectional area, and the type of metal, the charge carriers available within the metal. So this is something we can know about the copper. Delta V is something easily measured by our voltmeter. D is something we know certainly about the copper strip. We can measure its width very, very easily. So what that does is allows us to find the B field. It allows us to create a probe that we can stick into a magnetic field and boom, based on the voltage across the strip of metal, we can know what the B field is. So it's kind of a cool uh, application of this crossed field business. So I would like you to read uh, 740 to 743, work through the example that they give you, and figure out how this cross field stuff works. So I hope this was enlightening. I hope it helped. Uh, if not, I will be back soon. And um, hey, have a great day, folks. We'll talk to you later.